Hey, hey! All right, look, folks, I know it's been longer than I said it would be. Look, I'm bummed about it too. But you know what? We're here, and that's what counts. We're here, and we're repping Nicole. We come to this place for magic. It's been a hot second since we chatted. What's happened since then? Um, they butchered my girl. Dune 2. Kung Fu Panda 4. Madam Web. Did I see any of these things? No. Are they all on the list? Yes. Except Madam Web, obviously. Actually, you know what, I take it back. I probably will see Madam Web, just, just for the vibes at some point. Anyways, the important part is that we're back, baby, with the watermelon Rita in the dino cup. The arms of the I'm back with my second round of A24 movies. And look, will I get on a consistent schedule someday? Maybe, hopefully. It's hard to say with me. What I do have to say is week two of the A24 roundup, bangers only, kind of. In a time full of such hot releases, I decided to watch none of them and go back in time to 2013. Nina is struggling back here. Also, you can't see me. Don't look at my hair. We're going full frat. No, we are not. We're gonna fix the lighting instead. I can't go full frat. Much better. Anyways, the roundup for this week includes one, the Spectacular Now. <laughs> Banger. Two, Enemy by Denevian Way. And three, we're coming in hot with some more Sofia Coppola and the Blick Ring. So let's just get into it, baby. Let's start talking, cause we got a lot to cover. <laughs> ah, the Spectacular Now. This one holds a special place in my heart, folks. This was my very first all-time number one A24 movie. Now this is huge for me because, and you're gonna think I'm making this up, I know it sounds made up, I'm being completely honest with you. I specifically remember the first time I saw the A24 logo. I was watching The Spectacular Now, a movie that truly rocked my world. I had read the book, I was stoked to see the movie because I had seen the trailers Back as a kid, I used to browse IMDb for the new trailer releases. Maybe strange behavior, but it brought me here. I was so stoked to see the movie. And when that A24 logo ran at the beginning of the film, I specifically remember having a distinct feeling that it was important, that it was gonna mean something to me. I know it sounds made up, but it brought me here. And it brought me to my great love of film. So look, The Spectacular Now was right smack in the middle of what I think was sort of the golden age of indie, high school, coming of age, romantic drama films. This beautiful film showed really grounded, realistic pictures of teenagers as full-fleshed human beings, which is something that I think a lot of movies miss out on. We see kids as like half humans in high school, when really they are full beings with a full range of emotions. Crazy to think, I know, right? And it shows a beautiful picture of emotional intimacy, of difficulty with addiction, of struggling to find out who you are and what you mean to the world. Any number of themes you could go across the board, they're displayed beautifully in this film. If you're not familiar, The Spectacular now stars Miles Teller and Shailene Woodley in the two most prominent characters, though it has a great secondary cast of characters with Kyle Chandler, Jennifer Jason Lee, Bob Odenkirk, any number of people. Um, oh, oh, Caitlin Deaver, even Brie Larson. It's something that if you watch the film, you'll keep seeing people you know pop up and it's a pretty stellar cast. To start off, this is, I think, Miles Teller at his best. It is certainly my favorite role I have ever seen him in. He plays this character who's kind of the all charismatic, popular, everything man that everyone likes in high school. One of my favorite things about The Spectacular Now is that it's a movie where you know all of these characters. I knew a Sutter. I knew an Amy. I knew parents who behaved just like these characters did. And it's such a beautiful realistic picture of youth and adulthood on both ends that it's almost difficult to watch at some points. Miles Teller has this incredible charisma 
that sort of hides this brokenness inside his character. You don't see necessarily initially how badly he's suffering with addiction. We do have an incredible opening montage that introduces you to him very quickly and very soundly. We see where he is in his life, we see he has no direction, he doesn't know what he wants to do, and that he quite honestly doesn't know who he is. Sutter is a bit of a user. He uses Amy at moments to get things that he wants, but really he has come into her life at such a fortuitous time. They see each other for who they really are and they're able to find their way in life a bit better because of the influence that they've had on each other. Sutter has a really incredible dynamic with Jennifer Jason Lee, who plays his mother. They have this sort of snide mother-son relationship that is so true, it's so honest. I think it's something that you see it and you resonate with immediately because there's that sort of back and forth, snide, snippy comment relationship that doesn't damage who they are, but you can see that things aren't the best between them right now. Sutter can charm just about everyone. Through his struggles and difficulties, you see that he's a special person. He has a special charisma. He's also just the epitome of sadness in a way though. When you peel back all these layers of charisma and fun and the party guy and the guy who always has the drinks, he thinks he's genuinely unlovable and it's devastating. What he does in this incredibly strong way is he makes up these stories to cope with things he's not satisfied with in his life, particularly about his father. So enter Amy, this sweet, naive, unassuming, hardworking, smart girl, and somehow between all their differences, they really connect together. Shailene Woodley is, I think, also really at her best in this film. She's completely unassuming. She's not trying to be anything other than herself. She still has this shy nature to her though, but she doesn't necessarily stop from being herself to please others. She has what she thinks are these awkward, silly interests in sci-fi and reading, but she's not ashamed of them per se. She's just a little nervous to open up to people. She does that classic thing where when you show someone you really care about something you like, but you go, oh, but it's, it's stupid. And it's not stupid. Things we care about are not stupid. That's a tactic we use to cover ourselves, to protect from harshness and from cruelty from other people. And it's portrayed so perfectly in these little moments with Shailene and Miles. As their relationship develops, you watch them get closer and spend more time together and realize that at many times, this relationship means everything to Amy and sometimes nothing to Sutter. He's using Amy a little bit to get back at some moments at his ex-girlfriend. He's using her to help himself get through school and I think even to feel special. But the beautiful thing about Amy is she sees him so clearly. She sees who he is. She sees that peeled back nature of, of Sutter that maybe the rest of the world doesn't have access to. The version she sees might not be totally accurate. I think she sees him with a bit of a sense of rose tinted glasses rose-colored glasses, but she does see the good in him. In the same way that Amy makes Sutter a better person, we watch Sutter kind of chip away at Amy and force her into a lifestyle that's a little bit more on the edge of alcoholism, dangerous behavior, a lack of care about things that were previously important to her, but they do even each other out in a way. It makes me think a lot of, if you're familiar with Gilmore Girls, the relationship between Logan and Rory in college. I think it kind of mirrors that a little bit, except it's certainly more nuanced than on a TV show like Gilmore Girls. I think Amy portrays us all perfectly in a way where there's this interesting need to shy away from attention at moments and deny our own beauty when everyone else around her can see she's a beautiful person inside and out. If there's one thing this movie doesn't do, it's write a caricature of a person. These people have so many layers to them, so many nuances, so many parts that are ugly and so many parts that are beautiful that show the complexities that make up a real person. If you haven't seen this film, I would give a huge recommendation to go see it. I don't want to give away too much more in case this is something that you're wanting to see and haven't seen yet. But what I will say is that it is a great depiction of growing up how difficult maturing is as a young person, how hard it can be to live in a world where you've been abandoned or maybe feel like you've been abandoned, how easy it is to abuse substances, social politics, how challenging family relationships can be, how to set boundaries, how to stand up for yourself, and the list could go on and on and on. 
Some other highlights I would say to look out for are Mary Elizabeth Weinstead. She has an incredible moment of silent acting. You can just see emotion in her face so beautifully. Kyle Chandler's scenes, though he's very briefly in the movie, he leaves a real impression. All of the acting is top tier. I couldn't speak more highly of it, but make sure to pay attention to those secondary characters. There's a beautiful simplicity to the way it's filmed and even the lighting and the coloring of the film. It's very simple, it's very clear, and it's lovely. I will also say I think the kiss scene in the woods ruined my life because I had all these expectations of what would happen to me in high school and in my romantic life when I was growing up because of this movie. And you know, you can't expect a movie to dictate what your life is gonna be like. And in a way, it kind of ruined me. But it also built me up in a way of getting to understand what's behind the masks people wear. It's a huge, huge movie to me and my biggest recommendation of the week for sure. Next up, we have Enemy, directed by Denis Vianway. This is an extremely timely film. We are in the age of Dune. Dune 2 just came out. I'm hearing only positive things, extreme praise. Though this is unrelated to this movie, I do want to say I heard the most interesting anecdote that Denis Vianway had storyboards made for Dune from the time he was 13. So I think it's kind of beautiful that he's come full circle to make the Dune films, and I can't wait to watch the new one. I'm gonna keep this review or conversation a little bit short about Enemy, because if you've seen the film or if you do watch it, I think you're gonna understand that it's very challenging to talk about without giving away main points of the film. It's also very complicated and it's based heavily in metaphor. It's not necessarily the most narrative film you're gonna watch, so it can be a bit trickier to talk about. So right off the bat in Enemy, we get this interesting color grade of a film where it's a sort of hazy yellow dusty atmosphere that we're living in that immediately puts a weight of almost depression and anxiety over this film. Our main character is played by Jake Gyllenhaal in an almost sort of, I don't want to say Jekyll and Hyde, but that's the closest thing I can think of to call it, sort of role where he is perhaps his own worst enemy. The best way to describe this movie is by, I think, the quote they play at the beginning of the film. Right at the beginning of the movie, we have the title card come up and it says, chaos is order yet undeciphered. And that's the overarching theme to this movie, I think. You're not gonna quite understand this film until the very end. And then you probably still won't understand it until you sit with it a while longer or do some reading and try and unpack everything that you saw. We're following our main character who is a history teacher at a local college. You see him sort of pulled into this routineness of his life that he seems clearly not very happy with. You can really feel the mundanity of it all. So probably about maybe a third of the way through the movie, maybe even a little bit later, we see Jake Gyllenhaal's character find out about another man who looks exactly like him. And he doesn't react in the sense that this is just someone who looks just like me. He sees this man in a movie and he's basically his doppelganger. Jake Gyllenhaal plays both roles. But he gets immediately very anxious and freaked out by the fact that this man exists. I was very confused at this point why he would immediately jump to something sinister going on just because someone looks like him. But as it unravels, it starts to make more sense as a viewer. As he meets his doppelganger, things start to unravel further in his life. He develops a strange relationship with this man and things kind of dissolve quickly. About halfway through the movie, I made a note to myself thinking, this movie is less narrative and more just a feeling at that point. It's hard to describe, like I said, and at a certain point I stopped taking notes entirely of things to talk about. This film has a sort of Kaufman-esque style where things are played in allegory or in metaphor and they're not very clear to the viewer immediately what may be going on. I realize I haven't said anything very profound or very helpful. What I will say is if you enjoy watching films about breaking free from ourself, where you see beautiful cinematography, if you're willing to watch something based in metaphor with great performances, great physicality from the main actors, where you're almost watching a mystery, I would recommend this one. Denis Vianway has never once disappointed me. I love his, um, really his entire filmography that I've seen and this is just as masterful, it just might take you a little longer to unpack it. <music> Love.
Last up, we have The Bling Ring, directed by Sofia Coppola. We got more Coppola's sliding in here. This was a rewatch for me. I saw this, I think, about 2013, 2014, but I didn't remember much more than the general premise of the story. So this was a really fun one to revisit. This movie is about a story of a group of teens who, in real life, robbed many celebrities' houses in Los Angeles when they realized that they could look up their addresses online and find the keys under doormats and just sneak into homes and steal their own belongings. It's an interesting tale about this desire for fame, greed, and a real sense of superficiality. The most notable person you're gonna see in this cast is Emma Watson. I think this was probably not long after the last Harry Potter film came out or maybe as it was coming out, and it is a completely different character than what we had really seen Emma Watson play in the past. It was so refreshing at the time and it was great even to this day. Emma Watson is incredibly funny in this superficial, gross, money, fame, hungry model high school character that is everything that annoys you when you're young. Is she sort of a caricature? Yes, but she plays it to a T. It's hysterically funny. So look, what I want to say is, is this film a little bit tropey in its sense of high schoolers? Yes. Is it a little bit over the top often? Yes. But I think that's intentional. This film was based off the article about the real life events that happened. And I think all these over the top moments really highlight the materialism that existed at this time in this group of people and how existential it makes you feel. To me, this is and this is, again, my opinion, no disrespect to anyone who enjoys these other films or made these other films because all films have merit. This, to me, is the better version of Spring Breakers. We see what it's like to want a different life, to have such a desire for more that it pushes people to the extreme. Through the movie, we watch these kids become more and more greedy. We watch them become more desperate for these things things that will elevate their status, make them look cooler, make them mean something in this world of social media and superficiality and materialism. The need to belong controls you so much at this age. We see it in the spectacular now as well. High school is such a formative time for kids. Looking back, high school really doesn't mean all that much to a lot of us, but at the time that you're in it, it feels like the end all be all of life. It feels like the time where you determine who you are, the friends you make, and that will lay your path for the rest of your life. We watch some people with these needs veer off into darker lifestyles. We watch some people set themselves up for success, and that's a main theme of this movie too. We watch the people who aren't is willing to be involved with this crime, with this greediness, set against the people who are maybe borderline sociopathic and just want more to elevate status. There is an interesting element of the social aspects of this movie playing out as well as the crime drama element. I will say that since this movie is based on an article, it's based more around the event itself of these crimes than the people involved and sort of how the people involved were affected. A lot of the movie is interview style, cut in and out of clips of these robberies happening, but it is still very interesting. There are some really great comedic moments about those cliche, stereotypical Californians. It's tropey, but it does work at moments. Watch out for some really great comedy moments, also from Leslie Mann, who plays Emma Watson's mom. While this might not be my all-time favorite Sofia Coppola movie, I think it's worth watching, and it is such a time capsule of 2013 that if you want to go back to that time period, this is a perfect one to watch. The style could not be better portrayed. The costume director really, really flew off the handle with this one. And now it's time for our beloved tier list of the week. So for The Spectacular Now, this was easy. I didn't even have to think about it. I knew this was going in our S tier for Unearthly. I left this plane of existence while viewing. That's how I felt when I first watched it at 13, and that's how I still feel watching it at 23. There's no question about it. So Enemy is a little bit more difficult on this front. I will say I did very much enjoy watching this Denis film, but it is probably of his films my least favorite. I know that sounds very critical, I don't mean it to be. This is where it got tricky, because I wanted to put it somewhere very much in the middle for me. I wouldn't say it was mesmerizing to me, 
but it was a very strong movie. It's just something that's a little bit harder to grasp. I didn't want to leave it in enjoyable, some good elements could have been stronger because that didn't feel correct. The Bling Ring got the same treatment, felt very middling to me, not Sofia Coppola's best, certainly not her worst either. And um, well, that's where we ended up today. Altogether, this was a great batch of movies this week. We had things all across genres and had some really interesting watches. Watch along with me if you want in the coming weeks. Next week, we're gonna have some more great films. I don't think I've seen any of the films on next week's list, so I'm excited to try those out and get a sense of what A24 was making at the time and see something new that I haven't seen before. Let me know what your thoughts are on these movies if you'd like to join in the conversation. I'm always excited to talk about movies, literally always, always, always. Thanks so much for jumping in and we'll see you next time. Bye.